Um, my name is Dan Rogers. I'm a partner with Watson Farley here in New York. And I'm very pleased today to be hosting the panel on new and alternative sources of finance for uh, shipping and I suppose offshore as well. We have a really good panel here today. Um, sitting immediately to my left is Harris Antonio, who is the CEO and Chairman of the Management Board of Amsterdam Trade Bank. Sitting next to him is Andreas Rode, who is with Ocean Yield. I believe you are head of B uh, BD and m and is that correct? That's correct. Great. Then we've got uh, Michael Kirk with RMK Maritime, who is the managing director there. And finally, we have Michael Weitz, who is the president and founder of Yield Street. And I thought it would be useful um, because each one of these uh, organizations does slightly different things or maybe dramatically different things, to let them each give you a quick overview of what their organization does, and then we'll get into the conversation. So, Harris, why don't you start off? Uh, thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here at this Capital Link Forum. In fact, we've been regular participants of the forum for the past uh, few years. And um, uh, ADB, Amsterdam Trade Bank, that is, um, is a merchant bank that is focusing on the whole commodity value chain and trade value chain. In fact, um, the bank has been established 25 years ago in Amsterdam, uh, but as of three, four years ago, we decided to uh, reposition the bank along the uh, value chain of uh, trade and commodity, and that obviously includes uh, shipping. In fact, Sveas earlier said that um, uh, uh, connecting the molecules is probably one interesting strategy for one to follow. In fact, we're doing exactly that because we're involved in funding the value chain from all the way from extraction to uh, production of commodities to distribution, shipping and distribution. So actually that creates a very unique um, uh, oversight of what is happening throughout uh, this whole value chain and it's interesting both from a commercial and a, um, a risk point of view. Um, we're very pleased to be in this market. It's a huge uh, industry. In fact, I don't think it's a small industry. It's a huge industry. And this is why uh, we're in it. It's a very large addressable market. Uh, but unfortunately, over the past few years, and after the financial crisis, it has been left, I suppose, unattended uh, by a number of uh, major financial institutions. Uh, we think it uh, provides tremendous uh, interesting uh, prospects, interesting returns uh, for investors as well as uh, the banks, and that's why we're in it. Thank you. Good. Andreas, tell us a little bit about your organization. Yep, thank you. Um, Ocean Yale is a maritime leasing company, uh, predominantly focusing on uh, long-term bearable charters for uh, modern assets. Um, we currently have a fleet of uh, 58 vessels. Uh, ranging from bulkers to tankers to car carriers, uh, offshore assets. We have a very sort of pragmatic approach with respect to the various sectors that we engage in. Um, the long-term nature of our business um, gives us uh, long-term uh, visible cash flows. We have uh, around 11 years average term on our, uh, our book today, um, equating to around $3.6 billion on an EBTA basis. So, we uh, try to uh, pay stable, uh, predictable, and attractive dividends. I think our, our current yield is around 10%. Um, and uh, we currently have a market cap of uh, $1.2 billion. Uh, um, I think uh, we've, uh, we've been in this business since 2012 when the company was founded. We got listed in 13, and we've uh, managed to grow the business quite successful since then. I think what we experience in today's environment is sort of a it's been touched upon previously here, the uh, call it dislocation in the, in the financing markets where some of the banks are scaling back while the, the ones that are left are sort of focusing on the, the more established public players. So there's definitely a gap to be filled there. Uh, in addition to that, we're also seeing, I think, an environment where uh, shipping equities is a bit out of favor at the moment. Uh, so the cost of, of capital, not just cost of debt, is going up. So hopefully someone like ourselves can sort of help bridge that gap. Great. Michael, tell us about RMK. Thanks. Uh, so RMK is a maritime-focused investment bank, um, and we do only maritime, but we sort of across the spectrum in terms of products. So that's everything from sort of first lien, you know, first lien debt, unitranche debt, mezzanine, unsecured, convertible equity, convertible debt, and common equity. So I guess sort of if we were an ice cream shop, we'd be Baskin-Robbins, 31 flavors, sprinkles, chocolate, everything. Now, what I'm here to really talk about today, though, is Ascension Finance. So we just launched a first mortgage vehicle 
And if that was an ice cream shop, we'd be McDonald's when the chocolate's not working. All you can get is vanilla. Very, very simple. It's basically exactly like bank debt, but it's a little bit more expensive. And we'll, we'll kind of do ships that maybe banks won't do. So smaller owners, older vessels, we're sort of 55 to 65% LTV, L plus 6 to 700. All right, well, that brings us to, I guess, over to you, Michael, and Yield Street. Tell us a little bit about Yield Street. Sure, thanks for having me. So uh, Yield Street is a digital wealth management platform. What we strive to do is provide our retail investors access to institutional quality investments that they would otherwise not have access to. Our platform invests across multiple assets, real estate, litigation finance, subprime consumer loans, small business loans, and marine finance is one of those assets. We started the marine finance business in May of 2018. We felt that in line with some of the events that have occurred over the last decade in shipping, there was an opportunity to provide alternative financing. Um, what we do is we focus on first lien financing on second, uh, secondhand purchases on the acquisition side. We finance a deconstruction business. We do trade finance and we partner with banks to do mezzanine or BPs financing. Since we started in May of 2018, we have deployed $140 million in the maritime business alone. We have deployed close to $700 million on our overall platform. We are excited about shipping. We're committed to shipping. Many of you who know about us know that we have an office in Athens. The office has uh, some great people. We have George Kambanis, who was formerly from Deloitte. We have Stefanos, who was from DVB. Christos from um, RBS. And we just brought on a new hire to help us focus and expand and give us expertise in the operations side of the business from um, Ocean Rig. In general, I think that uh, for the rest of the year, we'll do about 350 to 400 million in the maritime space. And what we are really striving to build from a Yield Street Marine Finance business is to become the leader in the alternative financing, and namely to be you know, the place that ship owners and other platforms can come to when they're looking for timely financing and innovative financing that is not necessarily available to the market today. I think we have a different approach than most people, most other firms out there in how we finance. So we sit with different institutional warehouse facilities, but what really is powerful about our platform is we have over 120,000 investors. For example, last Tuesday, we had a $16.5 million shipping deal. It sold in 38 seconds to over 500 people. So the way we think about our business is the larger the ultimate investor base, there's basically no upper limit, and investors are looking for different types of risk, different durations, different yields, and different assets. So it affords us the luxury of having a flexible product and a flexible institution that we could bring to the shipping industry and the other in industries we're in. Thank you. Well, you know, you touched on the fact that since the financial crisis, the landscape has changed. It's been basically 10 years now. I, I think one of the questions I'd, I'd like to start with, and I think you've already addressed it in part, is what doors do you think closed from the traditional bank debt market, and which opportunities do you think that that really opened for you and uh, Yield Street when you entered the market a year ago? I think that the shipping industry may have gotten beaten up a bit more than some other industries, but I don't think it's necessarily entirely dissimilar to what you see, for example, in residential mortgages or other asset classes that have taken a hit. Um, namely, it seems to us a couple of you know, bigger trends have happened. So one, loan to values have come down, two, rates have gone up, three, participating number of banks and institutions have significantly pulled back, um, and four, which is really an area where we kind of are making our mark on the industry, is secondhand vessels, slightly older ships. Um, from, from what we can tell for the year prior that we entered the market as we were researching and for almost a year that we've been in the market, it seems to us that most of the banks are not willing to finance ships for 2008, 2009, 2010, 12. So we see a lot of opportunity there where the underlying values have come down enough to make the trade worthwhile because at the end of the day, for an investment platform like ours, what we're really looking for is principal protection. And we understand that there's volatility in the industry, there are gonna be ebbs and flows, and that's something that we can easily live with being charged by retail as opposed to institutional banks. We don't have capital calls, we don't have you know, equity requirements, et cetera, or liquidity issues. Um, but I think that all of those things have become present over the last 10 years and made room for a different type of finance, for a different type of investor to come into the market, um, for people to, to get the right priced risk and the right priced yield over time. 
and to think of you know, some more innovative ways into which we could finance this industry. Well, you know, I think it would be good to get Harris's point of view on that because obviously, although ATB has been around for quite some time, you know, its uh, involvement has really ticked up quite a bit into the shipping industry. And of course, ATB is, after all, a bank. So, what do you, what, do you agree with uh, what Michael said, or do you have any, you know, different, differing views? I think it's great that uh, finally there's uh, more uh, attention given to the industry and that Michael and others are trying to open up the investor space uh, for shipping finance in particular. Uh, I think that's uh, welcome. Um, we, uh, from our perspective, think that still uh, banking is the most efficient uh, and more appropriately priced way of actually channeling funds into the industry simply because I don't believe that uh, for an industry with an average return on equity over the cycle of 7 to 8 percent, uh, you can sustainably charge 10, 12 percent interest rate just for the debt alone. I don't think it works in the long run, and I think it will probably uh, create, again, dislocations in the market. Nevertheless, I do believe in what we call modular banking uh, today, uh, which means that uh, we traditional uh, shipping financiers that base the uh, transaction not simply on the metrics but also on the relationships uh, are able actually to structure, manage over the long run uh, transactions for the benefit of uh, the clients. In fact, are trying to wind down the portfolios rather than increase and I think that creates an interesting opportunity. Now, we are optimizing the flows internally. We're minimizing the time to market, which means the, uh, our ability to originate, uh, uh, assess, and execute transactions. And we do that, obviously, also for the benefit of the bank, but also for the benefit of other investors that wish to join us. Thank you. Um, Andreas, you obviously are offering a very particular product in a rather interesting market through the leasing vehicle. Obviously, there is a great deal of competition coming out of Asia, particularly the Chinese leasing houses. We had two uh, major leasing houses here on the bank panel. Uh, we also have the Japanese Jolcos, which are pushing very hard right now into the market. How does your product uh, distinguish from their product? I think, first of all, I think that the market is substantially big enough for, for all the uh, participants out there. I think the Chinese have definitely been, uh, been uh, quite successful in, in growing their portfolio and their exposure over the last couple of years, um, as well as the Japanese, which at least in our experience have been there you know, uh, for quite some time. I think the Japanese market remains very selective. It's often sort of one by one vessel and it, it takes time. Uh, I think the same goes for uh, for some of the deals out in China. It's uh, often it, it can take more time uh, from pro basically project initiation until closing. Um, I think what we try to offer is uh, a bit of uh, something in between. And I think uh, Michael Air made the analogy about uh, uh, McDonald's. I think what we see today is, uh, and this goes for both the banks and the um, and also our customers, they're all sort of looking for a happy, a happy meal. The banks are looking for low risk and, and high margins, and the customers are looking for low margins and high leverage. I think we try to sort of bridge that. Um, often uh, our product is a bit more sort of custom made uh, for the specific needs of our customer. Uh, no doubt we're, um, we're offering higher leverage than what our customers typically get on the banking side, and that often comes at, at the higher cost. But I think what, what people increasingly are seeing uh, as attractive with respect to leasing is the, the substitution that we can do, uh, and basically by substitution we can, we can release some of the equity that they would either have to put in or can take out of projects. And uh, you know, if you could do sort of an 85 to 90 percent lease relative to getting 60 to 65 percent bank financing, the delta is made up of equity. Uh, and I think uh, you know, all of us in this room uh, can agree that most of the shipping sectors today are basically trading at huge discounts to NAV. The cost of, of, uh, of that equity, you know, if it's available at all, is quite substantial. So you know, the competitiveness from, from that perspective is, uh, I think, increasingly um, uh, attractive. With respect to the competition, uh, I think we, we try to sort of be uh, a bit more agile. Uh, we are a fairly, um, I would say, quick responders, and we can do transactions uh, very quickly. I think our record from first call to basically signing a fully documented deal is sort of less than a week. 
Uh, that so, must have thrilled the lawyers. <laughs> yeah, I think we are definitely putting them to a test on that one. But uh, but I think that there are you know things like that that can sort of. Uh, where we can be sort of a partner for our clients in, in live transactions, whether that's SMP or M&A, or even you know, ticking the box of being fully financed in the capital raise. So there's uh, small differentiating factors that hopefully can, can be value added to our customers and, and put us sort of in a different bucket than, than the Chinese or the Japanese, which all have different attributes that make them attractive. Thank you. Well, Michael, you've got a new product, and where do you see the opportunity to really make uh, that product, you know, do something in the market? And is there a gap specifically that you're trying to fill, or is it just, you know, a nice, you know, uh, aimed at a particular, you know, segment of the market type of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's clearly focused at the people that are having trouble from the traditional sources, and then maybe people that want maybe a little bit more loan-to-value, for example, than maybe Harris's firm is, is going to offer. Um, I think where we're trying to really stay away from is kind of the really high LTV, very expensive stuff. Um, kind of Harris mentioned what returns are for shipping over the long haul. You know, I think if you look, you know, I think it's probably a little higher than, than sort of what people say, but it, it's not more than nine, nine, nine and a half percent unlevered kind of if you're buying mid-cycle. So, you know, we feel like lending under that level, um, you know, but close to it for people that are looking for financing that feel like they're making the right acquisition, you know, in terms of the cycle, you know, that makes sense. But borrowing at 12, 13 percent, you know, it's really hard for people to make those numbers work. And, um, you know, maybe it's not a borrower that, um, you know, that, that we, we want to work with if, that, if that's sort of where they're looking to borrow first lien debt. So I think we're, we're kind of clearly, it's, whether it's smaller mid-size owners or owners that are looking for a little higher LTV or some combination of those, um, but people that are not able to get it from the traditional sources and maybe have a little bit more cost sensitivity than some of the really high uh, priced options that you see from kind of the hedge fund type capital. All right. Well, let me ask another related question. I think we sort of danced around this little point, and I don't have it here on the list today, but do you think shipping companies are too thinly capitalized? Um, why don't we just start down at the end? Uh, Michael, what do, you, what do you think? I don't think it's a black and white question. I think that, you know, we've seen, let's call it 150-ish requests. I think there's plenty of shipping companies that we don't feel comfortable working with because they're undercapitalized. Um, we like to think that you need at least a couple million cash per ship. Just things go wrong and you need to be able to have that liquidity. But I think that there are plenty of shipping companies that are well capitalized. And I think that you know what we're seeing is, is interesting, which is not something we've touched on here. I think that when you look at uh, companies like Yield Street pricing and that call it you know L6 to L8 range, that the right place for that is tr transitional financing. I don't think that you know good companies, good shipping owners should be borrowing long term at those prices. I would agree with Harris that longer term people should try to strive for bank financing in every business. It's not exclusive to shipping, um, and I would think that Michael would agree with that too, right? I think what um, what you're seeing today in the market in the alternative sector is a combination of a few things. One is the opportunity set to buy into ship in, ships and opportunities that exist today for a particular reason, whether it be you know, a hardship from a particular shipping company or a bank letting go of um, older assets or a vessel that's trading below what someone thinks maybe it should be trading at. Um, so I think there's a lot of transitional plays going on. And I think that the companies that are taking advantage of those opportunities and coming to financiers like us to get a little bit higher leverage, quicker close, and then ultimately, once they you know, get a larger fleet, go to another bank, I think that many of those companies are well capitalized. Let me ask Harris, I mean, is capitalization one way to distinguish between the so-called tier one debt companies and lower tiers? Is that one way that ATB might look at it? Um, well, Traditionally, if you, if you look at the larger, you know, incumbents in this space, the banks uh, that are, you know, well known that have been involved in industry for years, they typically focus on the top 20. Top 20 meaning, you know, in terms of fleet size, in terms of equity, in terms of access to public markets, etc. But there are thousands of shipping companies out there that actually they're not top 20 and they're not publicly listed, and they still want to get access to funding because they need to you know, buy new vessels, renew the fleet, install a scrubber, et cetera, et cetera. Right. These are not necessarily tier two clients in terms of quality of the operation, but the tier two in terms of size. And we tend to look at the quality of operation in determining what is tier one and tier two, 
uh, and not just uh, the size. That's number one. Secondly, um, it's, it's notoriously c uh, cyclical industry uh, shipping. And uh, the, to your question about capitalization earlier, the reality is that what is today a well-capitalized company may not be a very well-capitalized company uh, you know, a year or two down the road if the market conditions change. Yeah. And the big question is, what happens then? You know, what happens if you bridge through the ratios? Yeah, you know, who do you have across the table to discuss what are you going to do with your shipping loan that, you know, because of the cycle, it breeds certain ratios. And that's why I think, you know, experience makes a huge difference in dealing with, you know, problematic situations. No, I, I think that's a very good point. And again, it's not something that we sort of prep for here a little bit, but it does raise a, a good, very good question. And Andreas, I'd like to maybe toss it to you. I mean, you know, when you do have, I mean, in, in a chartering context, a little bit different in terms of the covenant breaches, I suppose, it's really failure to pay charter hire. But how, how is, you know, what is the appetite within your organization to work with, you know, the, 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 the charter party and everybody else to make the transaction go through to the finish line? I mean, what would you do? I mean, are you going to pull back or are you going to try and, you know, find a reasonable accommodation to make the, the structure continue? Um, I think relative to a bank, I think we're somewhat different equipped in the sense that, you know, we can take delivery of the vessel and take her back and basically operate it. Um, we've done that uh, in a couple of instances where, you know, we have the capacity to either, you know, trade the vessel spot or to charter her out on a time charter basis, etc. So we're definitely there to, to work with our clients and, and work through situations. I think, you know, when, when you effectively lend money on sort of 10 to 15 year basis, I mean, in, in most shipping cycle, shipping segments, we're going to have at least two to three cycles during that period. So you, you'll have to understand the volatility and you have to be prepared to sort of also, you know, get your hands dirty as such and, and, and work with the clients and work through the situations. I think with respect to your, your previous question, I think that's also quite uh, rel relatively sort of linked into the ability to work with uh, people through the cycles. I think what we've seen over the last couple of years is I think shipping companies have definitely uh, started to use their, the broader toolbox to a much bigger extent than what we've seen before. I think historically shipping has sort of been made up of, call it, equity and senior debt. Uh, I think we now see uh, more and more companies sort of broadening their, uh, their funding base. Uh, there's new platforms being launched, there's new direct lending funds, there's sale and lease backs, there's unsecured bonds, and, and there's, uh, you know, we, we talked about private equity as one source that came in a couple of years back and then went back, went away. I think there's more sort of family office type of capital coming in. So, so I think that's, that's quite important as well that, you know, through the cycle there are different type of capitals, uh, capital available and, and you need to sort of, you know, constantly try and push your, your cost down. And what what's sort of interesting to us, at least, is that people now are more aware of the cost of capital, not just the cost of debt. Uh, and as such, you know, the different sources of equity is important. So yeah, things have definitely moved in the right direction. And will there be issues in the years to come, for sure? Uh, and I think all of us, whether you're direct lending or, or a sale and leaseback provider, will be, have to be prepared to be uh, sort of solution-oriented and work with our customers to, to have sustainable long-term structures in place. Well, that does raise the question long-term versus shorter term, the classic five-year term of a, a bank loan. Um, let me ask uh, Michael Kirk. I mean, are you looking at, at shorter-term structures, say two, three-year, mm -hmm. almost like a MES environment? What's, what's really your approach to that? We certainly do out of RMK. Um, you know, so bridge financing, short-term, um, absolutely. Um, in terms of the, the Ascension finance platform, we're typically looking at five-year loans. You know, if, we, if it's a very old ship, and it's coming up against the, the fourth or fifth survey, depending on the asset class, okay, maybe that might be slightly shorter to coincide with that kind of final dry dock where we're, where we're expecting the ship to be scrapped. Um, but our standard loan in Ascension is just going to be a five-year kind of plain uh, bank loan. Just plain bank loan? Yep. How about over at uh, Yield Street? What's the uh, view on the, on the tenor of the deals you like to do? So we typically do deals between... It depends on the strategy. Um, the deconstruction strategy, so the scrapping strategy, are either credit facilities to deconstruction firms or kind of one-term pulls. They want to buy a vessel, we finance that specific vessel. That's typically in the area of 180 days. You're really just financing the trade. So you have kind of six months to three years on deconstruction. On the sale leaseback and the vessel acquisition financing, you're two and four years, possibly go up to five years. Um, I would jump back to the last point that you were talking about for a second around 
you know, kind of covenant issues and, yes. you know, blowing through some of those issues. I actually, I think, uh, I don't see it different in this industry than it is in any other industry. I've been a lender for a long time and any lender who tells you otherwise is frankly lying to you. You're going to have issues with borrowers and there are going to be issues and cycles and you're going to have to know how to deal with it. For me personally and something that, you know, I've been sure to inculcate into Yield Street, you need to understand who you're lending to, you need to understand your client and you have to have a good relationship with your client. And I think that for the most part, um, it's an ad hoc and a case by case issue. If you have a client that's intentionally blowing through covenants, then my general attitude historically has been to be quite forceful. If you have a client that has an issue as a result of a cycle and you're being transparent and you're working together, then you create a solution around it. And if it means that you need to free up some of those covenants or take some more time, then that's being practical and you know, understanding both the industry, the asset class, and the part of the cycle that you're in. So I, I think that in general, for lenders, it's our responsibility to always be commercially reasonable and to try and be as supportive as we can to our borrowers and their businesses to help them kind of sustain these issues. And I think that equally it's important for the borrowers to be forthcoming, to be transparent during those times and to kind of work with their lenders. Okay, thank you. We've got about 30 seconds left, so I'm just gonna ask you know, quickly for a, a, a snapshot sort of answer. Do you think that uh, there will be further consolidation of capital sources in the industry, or do you think that that will actually only be at the bank level, resulting in further opportunities for what are euphemistically called alternative lenders? Harris, what's your take? I, um, I would say that um, we'll probably see, uh, it depends a little bit on uh, the way banks react to new regulation. I, and um, that means that if, if banks price risk appropriately, then the returns will be sufficient to justify their involvement in shipping and any other industry. If they don't, then we have a bit of a deja vu of what happened in the past, you know, dislocations in the market, um, you know, perhaps too, too much or too little capital going to the industry. So, um, the reaction to that is, is, is very key. But I, I also think that this opens up uh, uh, the door uh, of opportunity to alternative lenders. Absolutely. I think they're all welcome to join this great industry. Just want to make one point. I, I was reading, you know, a couple of months ago a, an article which was an eye-opener to me. Uh, this industry has a tremendous uh, future. Uh, I read that, in fact, China introduced maritime accounting and maybe some of our Chinese friends can verify this, back in 2006, and they started measuring what is called GOP, which is the gross ocean product of the mm. country, which is all the industries around maritime. And apparently it was already 10% of the GDP uh, a couple of years ago, but they wanted to be 30% of GDP by the year 2030. Uh, and that is a huge a big jump. growth, uh, which we're here to uh, capture, and I think, uh, U.S. institutions with, you know, access to cheap dollars should definitely play a part of it, and the way to do it is team up with uh, experienced banks or others that um, have the ability to read and, and uh, invest in the markets. All right, well, thank you guys very much. I'm afraid we're out of time, so um, if you have questions for our panelists, they'll be around today, and I'm sure they'll be able to speak with you directly. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.